Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun. A closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Up first, our Susan Spencer sat down with legendary documentary maker Ken Burns to discuss his newest project, giving context to America's complicated history with the Holocaust. We did not play a role in the murder of the Jews. We just did not do enough as a good people to get the people on the edge of this cataclysm out. And that is on us, on us, and will forever be on us. The documentary cites shocking national polls to make the point. In 1938, just two weeks after Kristallnacht, a night of terror when Nazis attacked and murdered Jews across Germany, only one in five Americans said the U.S. should admit more Jewish exiles. The following year, that number was one in 10. More exclusive excerpts from their conversation coming up a little later in the show. Uh, much of what you mentioned is offered not so much as an excuse as it is an explanation. There's the depression, there's anti-immigrant feeling, there's residual uh, isolationism from World War I. Is there any validity to that? I mean, does America well, get any sort of pass here? No, we don't get a pass. No, it's just excuses. And, and yes, I get it. I, I, I understand people are motivated by their pocketbooks in the midst of the greatest economic cataclysm in human history. Of course, you don't want to lose your job to somebody else, but it's somebody saying, you don't want to lose your job to somebody else. There is a broader humanitarian requirement that all of our religious teachings suggest that we acquire, that just a broad humanism or rationalist thought suggests that we do for our fellow human beings. That did not happen, and that is inexcusable. Then Moraka helps us find some beauty in the world by way of wildflowers. Today's subjects, these lavender lupins. Are they peaking now? Because they look beautiful. Yeah, the lupin, almost every single stalk has a flower on it right now. Every year, winter's snow gives way to summer's spectacular quilt that at its peak blankets the hills and valleys as far as the eye can see, earning Crested Butte the distinction of Colorado's wildflower capital. No repeat performances here. Every year is different. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. United States policy was not always an open door to those fleeing Nazi persecution, both before and during World War II. Ken Burns and his filmmaking partners examined that issue in their latest documentary series. Here's Susan Spencer. This wing of the family all died in the Holocaust. All of them. All of them. We're that really, dark chapter in history there. left an indelible mark on filmmaker Sarah Botstein's family. They died in the ghetto of Typhus. They were killed in a killing center. They died in all the different ways that the Jews in that part of the world died. So it was a deeply personal experience for Botstein to work on a documentary about the Holocaust with Ken Burns. So much has been written about the Second World War, about the Holocaust. Why did you even want to take another look? Seeing it through the lens of the United States helps us, I believe, understand the Holocaust itself in a, in a much different and perhaps fresher perspective. We tell ourselves stories as a nation. One of the stories we tell ourselves is that we're a land of immigrants. But in moments of crisis, it becomes very hard for us to live up to those stories. Their film, Seven Years in the Making, is entitled The U.S. and the Holocaust. In painstaking detail, Burns, Botstein, and their partner, Lynn Novick, unravel how America reacted to this humanitarian catastrophe. We failed. You know, we let in more human beings than any other sovereign nation. But if we'd done 10 times that many, I think we would have failed. And it's a failure at every level. It's a failure in the executive. It's a failure in the legislative branch. It's a failure in media. It's a failure in uh, the general population. Many white Protestant Americans came to fear they were about to be outnumbered and outbred by the newcomers and their offspring, that they were being replaced. 
The documentary cites shocking national polls to make the point. In 1938, just two weeks after Kristallnacht, a night of terror when Nazis attacked and murdered Jews across Germany, only one in five Americans said the U.S. should admit more Jewish exiles. The following year, that number was one in 10. Was this because of a lack of information? We cannot blame America's lack of action on not knowing. There was a great deal of coverage in the newspapers of what Hitler was doing as the situation got worse and worse and worse. Deportations, mass killings, thousands of refugees trying to get out, lines at consulates. All of this was known. But instead of opening our doors, we shut them ever more tightly, says Lynn Novick, who partly blames widespread American xenophobia. Celebrity aviator Charles Lindbergh was the face of it. He was an icon, he was a hero, they had songs about him, and he really believed a kind of ugly, anti-Semitic, white supremacist ideology that the Nordic race should prevail. He said these things, Americans clapped. One thing that has been cited in this discussion has to do with the context when this all happened. The depression was going on at the time, among other things. There was a lot of leftover isolationism from World War I. Does any of that, in your mind, give America a pass? I can't give America a pass on what happened and what we failed to do, but I can definitely appreciate the challenges and difficulties that our leaders faced. We did not play a role in the murder of the Jews. We just did not do enough as a good people to get the people on the edge of this cataclysm out. And that is on us, on us, and will forever be on us. Sharp limits on immigration had been in effect since the mid-20s, when quotas were set for each country. During the war, a State Department official named Breckenridge Long enforced those restrictions with gusto. He also assiduously worked to sort of suppress information about the true nature of the Nazi threat to the Jewish people of Europe. So reports came across his desk that he should have passed on to other people that he just buried. Reports such as extermination is a policy. Yes, exactly. We made it hard technically to get here. Paperwork, visas, affidavits, sponsors. I mean, you can appreciate now how hard it is just to renew your passport. And you're now stateless. You're in a country that's been taken over. We made it very onerous and hard to get here. So all of this, or most of this, is just paperwork. paperwork. Mm -hmm. And you just imagine for anyone who came here, all of this had to happen. In Lynn Novick's office, case files tell the story of World War II refugees desperate to get to America. Among them, a household name. When we started to make the film, it came to our attention that Anne Frank's family had tried to get to America, a fact that I did not know. And I don't think most people know that. I don't think most Americans know that. We all know Anne Frank, everybody knows Anne Frank. And to think that she could be here talking to you right now, if America had had a different immigration policy. That, you believe that? Tells that. You some, I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. By 1945, two out of every three European Jews had been murdered. Yet even then, only 5% of Americans wanted to let more refugees in, while more than a third said, we should admit even fewer. That's after you've seen the horrific images of the liberation of the camps and the bodies piled up and the emaciated people. That is a tough pill to swallow, very tough pill to swallow. You know? Are you worried that people will interpret this as sort of a indicting our nation, if you will? I, I don't see this at all as an indictment. I really don't. I think we're really, truly trying to just tell the story of what happened. It's not shaming America. It's thinking about how to do better. You will not replace us. Hundreds of white nationalists storming the University of Virginia. At the very end, there's this montage with no narration 
Charlottesville, a build a wall rally, a report of attack on a synagogue. What did you intend to convey with that montage? There is right now all of the elements coalescing for something bad to happen again. You felt a sense of urgency I, I growing. Feel, I feel a sense of urgency. We're not trying to equate anything with the Holocaust. That would be a, a, a horrible, a horrible thing to do. We're just saying, let's not get there again as, a, as, as human beings, please. Let's not get there again. More from Susan Spencer's chat with Ken Burns coming up in just a few minutes. But first, behold the beauty of Crested Butte, Colorado. Each year, all the colors of the rainbow sprout from the rugged terrain of the Rockies. And Moraka went there to take a look for himself. I think a piece of hail just hit me. <laughs> but that's part of the experience. I think we do have a little hail hitting us. Painting out in the wild doesn't always go as planned. But if your models are wildflowers, well, you don't have much of a choice. I guess if you weren't here, I'd probably be running for the car. Hmm, I... <laughs> <laughs> it's hail. Nicholas Reddy and his brushes have been braving the elements here in Crested Butte, Colorado for more than a decade. These uh, beautiful blues are the flax. Capturing the bright bursts of color exploding around this small town nestled high up in the Rockies. This is Mount Crested Butte, the mother rock that looks down over all of town. Reddy, who owns the downtown gallery Oh Be Joyful, starts with a sketch before committing to his canvas. I'm never trying to make a, a finished masterpiece out here. I'm more exploring, trying to enjoy being outside. Today's subjects, these lavender lupins. Are they peaking now? Because they look beautiful. Yeah, the lupin, almost every single stock has a flower on it right now. Every year, winter's snow gives way to summer's spectacular quilt that at its peak blankets the hills and valleys as far as the eye can see, earning Crested Butte the distinction of Colorado's wildflower capital. No repeat performances here. Every year is different. Since 1986, the former mining town has celebrated its blooms each July with a week-long festival for hikers, bikers, pedal peepers, and art enthusiasts. This image was inspired by a high country view in about the first week in August. One of Nicholas Reddy's paintings is the official poster for this year's festival. Is this your first time painting This is my first time painting it. It makes me that much closer to becoming a local, you know, <laughs> after 12 years. Come on over, guys. Former festival chairman Rick Revis is one of the state's foremost wildflower experts. Scarlet Gilia, it's a plant named after a Italian clergyman. He's also an interpretive guide at the nearby Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, where for more than half a century, researchers have been collecting data on the local buds. Blue flax, oh my gosh, guys. During the festival, Revis leads hikes for flower fanatics from as far away as New Zealand, who marvel over some 1,500 species. With the presence of Indian paintbrush, there's uh, more diversity of other plants. Okay. Can I also say something? Oh yeah. Indian paintbrush is the state flower of Wyoming. Yes. Okay. Some names are as fanciful as the flowers themselves, from elephant's head and sky pilot to shooting star. Isn't there one called sneezeweed? Sneezeweed, yes. The sneezeweed plant was used by miners. They would make a snuff. They would <laughs> snort the snuff to expel dust from coal. But don't even think about snorting or swiping sneezeweed. Picking wildflowers on public land is strictly prohibited. You're not coming here to pick and no take No picking home with flowers, you. no, and stay on the trails. The stunning variety of wildflowers is the byproduct of the area's isolation, a slow rate of snow melt, and a nutrient-rich soil that together produce... Wait, is that a weed? Dutch clover, white Dutch clover. Daylion right there. Let's settle this. The, da <laughs> the dandelion. Yes. Is it a wildflower or a weed? 
Um, a little bit of both. Dandelions aren't native to the area. That's partly what makes them weeds, but they serve an important function. That flower serves as a food source for species of bees, and that's very important. Those bees have been just as helpful in keeping the wildflowers flourishing as coal once was to keeping Crested Butte's economy thriving. We didn't have much gold. We have a few veins of silver. So during the gold rush, many of the people that came out went on and continued on to California. Local historian Glo Cunningham says coal was king starting in the 1880s. But when the town's big mine closed in 1952, most of the 1,500 residents were left jobless. And that's when we went down to about 150 to 200 people in town. The ski resort opened in the early 60s, but Cunningham, who has been here since 1975, says wildflowers helped make the town a summer destination. I find it very magical here. Yeah. Every year. I still wake up every morning and go, whoa, look where I live. So that's the columbine. And the state flower actually is the one through the fence. Ah, the blue that's one. That's the light bluish mm -hmm. one. Cunningham leads tours of gardens right in town. Some people can't hike. 2,000 feet up to Hazley Basin. Some people can walk a long way and some people can't. Some people can. Yeah, and I've had people in wheelchairs. Yeah. I love it. That love is apparent all season long. From the spring's first glacier lily to the fall's last fireweed. The fireweed is so beautiful. It's bittersweet because you know winter's coming soon. Winter promises to bring plenty of snow which will yield yet another season of wondrous wildflowers. Nicholas Reddy will be waiting. Is it hard to see them go each year? Oh, it's terribly sad. So the snow's coming. Right. <laughs> Gotta paint fast. Gotta paint fast. Well, you know, FDR is, um, he's not a king. He's not a Fuhrer. And so he can't by fiat just say, I'd like to make this so. He is also a politician and he knows which way the wind is blowing. After the break, more with filmmaker Ken Burr. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more from Susan Spencer and Ken Burns. About 10 minutes into the film, I watched every second of this. It was, Thank you. It's quite amazing. Um, about 10 minutes in comes a statistic that stopped me cold. And I want to know how you grappled with this. There's some general scenes of people outside. Then there's a lovely shot of a woman who appears to be at a window sewing or something. Just an ordinary scene. And the narration tells us that between 33 and 45, something like two out of every three European Jews was murdered. How can you work on a project like this and grapple with that kind of information day after day? Well, this is our struggle and the struggle of many others trying to come to terms with the Holocaust. The word six million, the number of Jews killed, the approximate number of Jews murdered in the Holocaust, is, is an impossible number now. It's very opaque. You can't get into it. You can knock right. on it, but it doesn't yield anything. But if you change that around and say there are nine million Jews in 33, and two out of three are killed, and you're looking at a woman who's joined by two people, you then can do an intimate calculus, an intimate mathematics, in which you realize that two of those three people are going to disappear from the face of the earth for no other reason than the fact that they are Jewish. All of this is going on in the 30s. What, how would you characterize America's attitudes uh, during that period of time, America's attitudes toward immigration? So the Holocaust takes place, what we call the Holocaust takes place after the first, the Second World War begins in 39, and, and it begins really in the 40s to take place. But there's a great deal of anti-Semitism that, that is happening in Germany. The United States is going through a depression. Jobs are scarce. Um, there's always been a kind of latent anti-Semitism and racism and nativist sentiment. The doors have been closed in 1924 with the Johnson-Reed Act and earlier Act in 21 that are limiting the number of people, particularly from the countries that will be most directly affected so, by the Holocaust. So we're not disposed to let in anybody. And we don't want to do that because they are job stealing, but it also appeals and permits the people who like to appeal to the darker side to appeal to that darker side and remind people that you know Jews are controlling this and Jews are that. And the United States becomes indifferent in a way to what's going on. 
much of what you mentioned is offered not so much as an excuse as it is an explanation. There's the depression, there's anti-immigrant feeling, there's residual uh, isolationism from World War I. Is there any validity to that? I mean, does America well, get any sort of pass here? No, we don't get a pass. No, it's just excuses. And, and yes, I get it. I, I, I understand people are motivated by their pocketbooks in the midst of the greatest economic cataclysm in human history. Of course, you don't want to lose your job to somebody else, but it's somebody saying, you don't want to lose your job to somebody else. There is a broader humanitarian requirement that all of our religious teachings suggest that we acquire, that just a broad humanism or rationalist thought suggests that we do for our fellow human beings. That did not happen, and that is inexcusable. Describe for me some of the political pressures that FDR was under. Well, you know, FDR is, um, He's not a king, he's not a Fuhrer, and so he can't by fiat just say, I'd like to make this so. He is also a politician, and he knows which way the wind is blowing, and he understands that many things that perhaps he would want to do, certainly his wife would want him to do, and she is every day in his, his ear um, about this thing or that thing, uh, he cannot do. And so there's a kind of disappointment that you feel that, uh, among the many people who did not do all that they could do is the President of the United States. But then you also have to look back on it and say, what would have been the consequence if you'd done this in terms of public opinion? Would you then have been able to get these other things that are important to it, like ending the Neutrality Act or Lend-Lease or things like that? So, you know, you can't get into his mind. I've spent as much time of my professional life w inside his head as, as anybody else. Um, but, but it is, everybody fails in this story. Do you think FDR actually believed that ending the war should triumph over anything else? That, that the faster he could end the war, the faster the killing would stop? Yes, I believe that he felt that that was the case, but I don't say that's okay. You know, I think there could have been more things to do. Deborah Lipstadt, the great mm -hmm. uh, Holocaust scholar in the film, says so many important things. One is the time to stop a Holocaust is before it stopped. But she said, we could have done more. We could have advertised more. We could have publicized with no harm to the war effort what was going on that might have then relieved the pressure at all the few remaining points where people were getting out, like Lisbon and Morocco and, and other places. And that would have perhaps allowed other people to come in and get out. I think we could have saved many, many more people uh, had we had the will to do it. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.